The meaning of blessing is to give special consideration or privileges to something that you reverence. I don't know which blessings are on your wish list. You may have a wish list. I wish I had these blessings in my life. I would love to have that blessing of a, you might think, a new job or a new car or a, vac a vacation or a house. But don't ever forget that the greatest blessings that one could ever hope to have are already paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's sad when Christians live with discontent when they already have what the whole world's looking for. We have certain things that we put on our blessing dashboard to determine whether we are blessed or not. But if you want to know whether you're blessed on any given day, jobs, houses, things are not the most important things. The greatest blessings in your life involve your relationship with Jesus Christ. Today, I'm going to do my very best to persuade you that to put grace and salvation on your blessing dashboard would be very wise. So that when you wake up in the morning and you want to know, am I blessed? Am I a recipient of grace today? Do I have salvation today? Every day is a blessed day because every day I am a recipient of God's grace and his salvation. Now why have I paired grace and salvation together in this message. What is the relationship between grace and salvation? I'd like to show you Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. The Apostle Paul shares this with us. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So just notice this with me that Paul says that God's grace brings salvation. God's grace brings salvation. Let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about grace. No takers, grace is the kindness God shows us that we don't deserve. Grace is the kindness that God shows us that we don't deserve. Undeserved kindness or, as many people like to say, unmerited favor. And let's look at that word salvation very quickly because we're talking about grace and salvation. What is salvation? Note taker, salvation is deliverance from the life and consequence of sin. Salvation is the deliverance from sin and the consequence of sin. Everybody say salvation. And grace brings salvation. We have done nothing nor could we ever do anything to deserve salvation, but God did it for us. He brought salvation to us, even though we don't deserve it. In fact, another meaning of that word grace is to lean toward. Grace means to lean toward or to stoop down. So God who is holy, is looking for a way into a relationship with me. He's leaning in. He's not leaning away. Amen. Do you ever try to hug a kid in junior high? <laughs> now, we try, to, we try to just push through that whole season with our kids when they're, you know, teenagers in junior high and, and all of a sudden they don't want the hugs and you're leaning in for the hug and they're leaning away and... And Heather and I, we just came through the front picture window with all of our hugs. But God's not like a junior higher when you're reaching out in praise and he's leaning away because you've got bad breath. Because your life doesn't smell good. No, God is leaning in. This is a God of grace. He's looking for a way in to you. Hallelujah. God, who is holy is looking for a way into a relationship with me, not a way out. And it's mind-blowing because God by nature is holy and I by nature am sinful. Our relationship should be irreconcilable, but God bridged the gap when he came to earth and conquered sin for me so that I could have a new nature. God was in Christ and reconciled us by his sacrifice on the cross. And this is why I like to say that I'm blessed and I can't help it because every day that I wake up, my heavenly father is leaning in. He's stooping down. He's interested in having a relationship with me. 
Daryl Johns, one of my heroes, he's a pastor in Atlanta, and he was a youth president when I was just a kid, and I'm blessed to be a, a personal friend, and we talk, and he's a hero. I tell him when, when I grow up, I want to be like him. I admire him so much. I remember him sharing uh, a definition of grace that I want to share with you. He said that the grace is the strength God gives us in our weakness. Grace is the strength God gives us in our weakness. And he gets this from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, where Paul says, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in your, but weakness. He's talking about our weakness. My strength is made perfect, Paul, in your weakness. Paul says, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities. In reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Grace is the strength God gives me in my weakness. Let me ask you a question. What is your thorn? If, if Paul had a thorn in his flesh, you've got one too. What is your thorn? What is always there that reminds you that you're not perfect? In spite of all this time that you live for God, what weaknesses are you still susceptible to? God says, my grace is enough, and my strength is made perfect in your weakness. When you're reminded that you are weak and flawed, and we are often reminded of our weaknesses and our flaws, remember that he is strong. This is God's grace. Every time you see your own fallibility, celebrate his infallibility, the perfection of God that is working in you and working for you. Brothers and sisters, we are blessed by God's grace. Put God's grace on your blessing dashboard. I may not be perfect, but I'm blessed by God's grace. Romans 5, 20 but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. I'm so thankful for that. And in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 20, there's this passage of scripture. I love it. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Now this is powerful because our heart does condemn us. You know... We know ourselves very well. And so our conscience stands behind the pulpit of our mind and begins to preach to us. And our heart can condemn us because it knows us. And, and, and not only that, but the Bible says that our heart is even deceitful sometimes. And so our heart can do a better job than it should to point our weaknesses. We can condemn ourselves. But here's the thing. My heart fully knows me, and my heart can condemn me, but my heart does not fully know God. So just know that whatever your heart is saying about you, the scripture says that God is greater than your heart, and he knows all things. What does that mean? Just remember that when your heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart, and God knows that he loves you, and God knows that he forgave you, and God knows that he has better, better things for you, and that his grace is greater than your sin. Sometimes when we preach about grace, we struggle with the concept because our heart is screaming at us that we are unworthy. Our heart is screaming at us that it's, it's over, that, that this grace thing is for somebody else, but not for us. But God is greater then our heart. Amen. Aren't you thankful for God's grace? 
And can we be clear at ATC, we do not teach that grace is a license to sin. This is why I personally believe that sometimes as apostolics we're underdeveloped in the concept of grace and the doctrine of grace because we have seen the, this, the misuse of grace and the abuse of grace. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? It's a good question. Should we continue in sin so that we can receive more grace? He says, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer therein? That's a great, great question. Right? How do we die to sin? Look at this, verse 3. Do you not know that as many of us as were what? Baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? This is what he's saying when he says, how shall we who died to sin live any longer therein? We were baptized. Therefore we were, past tense, buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So the Bible is letting us know that we should be dead to sin. I'm talking about grace right now. Should we continue to sin so that we can and say that God is good and God is forgiving and God is a God of grace? Paul says certainly not. We should walk in newness of life. So grace, now write this down, note takers, you need to know this and you need to, to harvest this idea that grace is the enemy of sin, not the ally of sin. Grace empowers a godly life. And it's crazy to suppose that the medicine of grace would cause the disease of sin to metastasize on your soul. But this is how many Christians see living for God. It doesn't matter how I live, God will forgive me. And then there are people who will look at apostolics and say, oh, you poor thing, you believe in holiness. You believe in separation, living a holy, clean, consecrated life. I can drink this because God's a God of grace. I can smoke this because God's a God of grace. I can do this because God's a God of grace. And I'm not condemned because there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And they really just go through this whole crazy deception. And grace, in their mind, is something... It's, it, it's a cloak for their leprosy and not a cure. But let's go back to Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, because I want to push on this thing called grace, and I want us to celebrate it and know that we are recipients of grace, but we must understand what it is and what it isn't. Let's look at verse 11 again. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Grace brings salvation. But what does it do? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live what? Soberly. We should live righteously and what? Godly in this present age. That's what grace empowers me to do. Grace empowers me to live a godly life in this present age. How powerful is God's grace and salvation. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from what? From every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So go ahead and make fun of us about good works. Go ahead and make fun of us because we preach righteousness. That God is looking for a special separated people who are pure. We understand what grace is. It's not loving to leave us the way we are. And God loves you too much to leave you the way you are. And the church said amen. Amen. Grace brings transformation, not more sin. 
God is leaning into that life. God, grace is leaning in. And that life that loves God is leaning into God. God's leaning into you. You're leaning into God, not the world. So if sin is delighted in, then we don't have God's grace. Amen? As a believer now, we're talking about grace. This is one of the great blessings of our life, and I'm trying to clarify. As a believer, you might sin. You might sin. But a believer does not live in sin. Understand that, young people. Understand what I just said there. As a believer, you might sin. But if we're true believers, we don't live in sin. When you're living in sin, you are sinning without remorse. When you're living in sin, you find pleasure in committing sin and look forward to the next time. When you're living in sin, you want more sin but not more of God's word. When you're living in sin, you make excuses for that sin rather than repenting of that sin. When you're living in in sin, instead of pursuing God daily and walking in his spirit, you are pursuing and feeding your flesh daily. Again, I say, as a believer, you might sin, but a believer does not live in sin. God cannot live in you until you die to yourself. Paul says in Galatians 2 and 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Hallelujah. It is no longer I, but Christ who lives in me. We're talking about God's amazing grace. What a story, what a story. Now, I want to read you an excerpt from a book entitled Proof, written by Daniel Montgomery and Timothy Jones. And this story was written by Timothy Jones. Now, I don't typically read you excerpts from books. But this excerpt is just, you'll understand when I'm done, how it beautifully illustrates grace. Again, Timothy Jones is writing. Our middle daughter had been previously adopted by another family. I'm sure this couple had the best intentions, but they never quite integrated the adopted child into their family of biological children. After a couple of rough years, they dissolved the adoption, and we ended up welcoming welcoming the eight-year-old girl into our home. For one reason or another, whenever our daughter's previous family vacationed at Disney World, They took their biological children with them, but they left their adopted daughter with a family friend. Usually, at least in the child's mind, this happened because she did something wrong that precluded her presence on this trip. And so, by the time we adopted our daughter, she had seen seen, uh, many pictures of Disney World, and she had heard about the rides and the characters and the parades, but when it came to passing through the gates of the Magic Kingdom, she had always been the one left on the outside. Once I found out about this history, I made plans to take her to Disney World. In the month leading up to our trip to Magic Kingdom, she stole food when a simple request would have gained her a snack. She lied when it would have been easier to tell the truth. She whispered insults that were carefully crafted to hurt her older sister as deeply as possible. And as the days in the calendar moved closer to her the trip, her mutinies multiplied. A couple of days before our family headed to Florida, I pulled our daughter onto my lap to talk to her about her latest escapade. I know what you're going to do, she stated flatly. You're not going to take me to Disney World, are you? The thought hadn't actually crossed my mind, but her downward spiral suddenly started to make some sense. She knew she couldn't earn her way into the Magic Kingdom. She had tried and failed that test several times before. So she was living in a place that lived... So she was living in a way that placed her as far as possible from the most magical place on earth. In retrospect, I'm embarrassed to admit that in that moment, I was tempted 
to turn her fear to my own advantage. The easier response would have been, if you don't start behaving better, you're right, we won't take you. But by God's grace, I didn't. Instead, I asked her, is this trip something we're doing as a family? She nodded, brown eyes wide and tear rimmed. Are you part of this family? She nodded again. Then you're going with us. Sure, there may be some consequences to help you remember what's right and what's wrong, but you're part of our family and we're not leaving you behind. I'd like to say that her behaviors grew better after that moment. They didn't. Her choices pretty much spiraled out of control at every hotel and rest stop all the way to Lake Buena Vista. Still, we headed to Disney World on the day we had promised, and it was a typical Disney day. Overpriced tickets, overpriced meals, lots of lines, mingled with just enough manufactured magic to consider maybe going again someday. In our hotel room that evening, a very different child emerged. She was exhausted, pensive, and a little weepy at times but her month-long facade of rebellion had faded. When bedtime rolled around, I prayed with her, held her, and asked, so how was your first day at Disney World? She closed her eyes and snuggled down into her stuffed unicorn. After a few moments, she opened her eyes ever so slightly. Daddy, she said, I finally got to go to Disney World, but it wasn't because I was good. It was because I'm yours. It wasn't because I was good. It's because I'm yours. Grace isn't a favor you can achieve by you simply being good enough. It's a gift that you receive because you belong to God. Grace is God's goodness that comes looking for you even on your worst day, even on your worst day. It's a farmer paying a full day's wage to a crew of deadbeat day laborers with only a single hour punched on their time cards. It's a man marrying an abandoned woman and then refusing to forsake his covenant with her when she turns out to be unfaithful, Hosea chapter 1 through chapter 3. It's the insanity of a shepherd who puts 99 sheep at risk to rescue the single lamb that's too stupid to stay with the flock. It's the love of a father who hands over his finest rings and robes to a young man who has squandered his inheritance on drunken binges binges with his fair weather friends. Isn't God's grace amazing? Aren't you blessed? Isn't it incredible that this isn't merely what God the Father, our Father, would do, but who, what he did do? He did do. God in Christ has declared over you, I could have chosen anyone in the whole world as my child, and I chose you. You're adopted. He said yes to you. And what he's given you entrance to, you didn't get it merely by your good behavior, but because of his amazing grace. So Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 rings clear to me. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Can we take a moment and just thank God for his amazing grace. Can we thank him that it's ours? Can we thank him today that we are blessed? Lord, my world may not be perfect. I may not be perfect, but you're leaning in. We thank you for it, Jesus. And grace leads us to salvation. Again, salvation is deliverance from the life and consequence of sin. Yes, sin must be addressed. Sin must be addressed if we are to have a conversation about salvation. 
1 John 1 and 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So don't buy into the idea, I'm a good person. I'm good. I'm a good person. I don't care if your mom told you you're a good person. I don't care if your co-workers told you a good person. I don't care if you have a certificate to prove that the community thinks that you're a good person. The Bible says if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Isaiah 53 and 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All, we've all gone astray. We've turned to our own way, the Bible says. Isaiah 59 and 2, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Proverbs 16 and 25, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. But Jesus Christ says to us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. I'm trying to tell you there's a way to a man that seems right, but it's not the right way. But Jesus is the way. He's the only hope of the world for salvation. He's the only way that we can be delivered from our sinful lives and from the penalty of sin in our life. Jesus Christ, who was and is God in flesh, will take your sin and give you the blessing of salvation. Somebody said amen. Isaiah 43 and 25, uh, 5, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. We're talking about salvation. We're talking about the blessing of salvation in our lives. Hallelujah. Your heart can still condemn you about what you did in the past, but God is greater than our heart. And when our heart reminds us of our sin, God remembers his decision to forgive us. What a great God we serve. Micah 7, 18 through 19, who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity. And passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage, he does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Thank God for salvation. Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. For we ourselves were also once foolish. Does that describe anybody? Can anybody say, I was once foolish? We were once foolish, disobedient. Can anybody say amen to that? How about this? Deceived. I was wrong and I didn't know I was wrong. Serving various lusts and pleasures. Can anybody say amen? Amen. Living in malice and envy, hateful. And hating one another, this is what we were. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he did what? He saved us. Before you convince yourself that your life isn't good because you don't have some physical thing on the blessing dashboard, Would you please remember this, where you were and how God saved you? Will you remember that? My, thank you, Jesus, that you saved us. And how? Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, That having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 9 through 10, as the musicians come. He says, for I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Verse 10, 
but by the grace of God, I am what I am. I love it. I love it. By the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. This is what I was. This is what I did. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Hallelujah. That's your story. Don't lose touch with your story. Don't lose touch with your story. Don't lose the joy of your salvation. Don't lose the joy of what Jesus has done in your life. Don't lose your joy because you don't have stuff. Don't lose your joy because you didn't get the raise. Don't lose your joy because you didn't get the job. Don't lose your joy. Today is a blessed day. I am persuaded that there are people within the sound of my voice who needed to hear this message. I am persuaded that there are people within the sound of my voice who have not yet repented of their sins, who have not yet been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, who have not yet received the gift of God's Holy Spirit because you have felt unworthy, unworthy. It was for everybody else. Everybody else has been to Disney World, but not you. Because you didn't behave. Because it's been, your story has been one more of rebellion than anything else. And our Heavenly Father is saying to you, I'm leaning in today. Someone needs to come to this altar with a revelation of God's grace and fully repent of their sins. And someone needs to say, I want to be baptized in Jesus' name, and I'm receiving this grace gift. I don't deserve it, but it's mine. Would you stand with me? Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 tells us how we can receive salvation today. We must, of course, have faith in our Lord. And when we believe the message, the word that we have received today, we can repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins, and we shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Who hasn't spoken in tongues because you just don't feel worthy? Who has not yet been baptized with the Holy Ghost? You've not spoken in tongues because there's been a part of you you've always held back because you didn't feel worthy. Can I tell you that grace leads to salvation, not your works? In Jesus' name. Young people, I want to talk to you right now. Are you living in sin? Are you living in sin? If you're living in sin, this message is for you. You can come to this altar, repent today, and say, Jesus, forgive me. I'm receiving a grace gift of forgiveness today. And I'm choosing, Lord, to be spirit-led and to hunger for your spirit, to not feed my flesh. God, if I will walk in your spirit, your word declares to me, I will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Is there anybody who would like to come and seek God? Is there anyone who would like to receive grace gifts from our Father? Is there anyone who would like to receive salvation? This altar is available for a church who believes in grace and believes in salvation today. In Jesus' name, Lord, we honor you and praise you. We exalt you, our great King. Yes, Lord, you have shown kindness to us that we don't deserve. Thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for your grace gifts. Thank you, Lord, for the strength you bring to us in our time of weakness. Thank you, God, that you deliver us, Lord, from the presence of sin and the penalty of sin in our life. Lord, I pray that the waters of baptism would be stirred. I pray that confession would be made at this altar today in Jesus' name. I pray that someone would begin to surrender, Lord, to your spirit and speak with other tongues. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's lean in. 
Lean into God. He's leaning into you today. 